Hello everyone. Uh, we start the course Quantum Mechanics for BSc Physics. In this introductory class, we discuss the evolution of modern physics. Consider these words of Albert Michelson, an experimental physicist, uh, in the year 1894. The more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered. Our future discoveries must be looked for in the sixth place of decimals. He was an experimental physicist. Uh, he was famous for the accurate measurement of the speed of light. And I think he was also the first uh, physicist from USA who got Nobel Prize in Physics. And uh, his uh, idea is that uh, everything, uh, every fundamental law in physics has been discovered. Okay, this was in the year 1894, okay, towards the end of 19th century. Uh, so what is remaining for the scientists to do? To make more and more accurate measurements, okay? Whatever has already been measured, you, you measure it again. You add one more decimal point. That is the metaphorical usage of the word sixth decimal point. You add one more decimal point. That means you make a more exact measurement. So this is the only remaining thing, thing for the physicist to do. Okay, make more and more accurate measurements of all what already is available. Nothing else. Okay, that was the spirit of uh, in which Michelson um, <clears throat> was saying. And uh, this was not uh, a, a solitary idea. Michelson was not alone in this uh, in this idea. There were many physicists who, who shared this um, this spirit, this feeling that uh, everything has already been discovered. Okay, there is nothing new to be. Uh, discovered in physics. Okay. Now see what happens within one year of Michelson's uh, um, utterance. Okay. Uh, I have listed here some new experimental discoveries between the two year span, uh, 1895 to 1897. In 1895, Rongen discovered X-rays. In 1896, Henry Becquerel discovered natural radioactivity. In the same year, Seaman, Peter Seaman discovered Seaman effect. Seaman effect is something uh, where in the presence of a strong magnetic field, atomic spectral lines are split up into different components. And in 1897, J.J. Thomson, British physicist J.J. Thomson discovered a particle smaller than even the lightest atom, electron. Hmm. So these experimental discoveries were quite new. In the sense that many aspects of these experimental discoveries could not be explained by the existing classical physics. So we should remember that these discoveries came just uh, starting from just one year after Michelson uh, was saying that uh, there was nothing new to be discovered in physics. So we can say these experimental discoveries started a new era in physics. Here on the left side we can see one of the first X-ray images. In this case, uh, it was taken by Rongen. This is the image of hand of Rongen's wife, Anna. You can see her wedding ring here. This was one of the first images, X-ray images. Let us see another physicist, uh, a senior physicist, Lord Kelvin, uh, speaking on 27th April 1900. Um, he, these are his words. Uh, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurements. Okay, this is uh, uh, these are just uh, the same idea of Michelson in other words. Actually, there is a story that uh, it was uh, Michelson, even though he was speaking in 1894, Michelson was uh, saying so only because uh, he listened to Lord Kelvin speaking on other occasions. Uh, obviously, Lord Kelvin was repeating the same idea on many occasions, uh, even well before 1894. So it is uh, said that Michelson actually listened to Lord Kelvin uh, making this statement even before. And uh, that was why um, he expressed the, it was Michelson who was expressing, repeating Lord Kelvin when he was speaking in 1894. So we can see the startling uh, resemblance between Kelvin's words and Michelson's words. Okay, There is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Uh, he was uh, addressing Royal Institution of uh, Great Britain 
uh, on this date 27th april 1900 and uh, he was uh, delivering a talk titled 19th century clouds over the dynamical theory of heat and light right we will come back to this title a little later now uh, what were those uh, 19th century clouds looming over physics let us remember that uh, lord kelvin was uh, uh, talking on the dawn of uh, 20th century okay that was 1900 27th april so what was he uh, speaking about uh, 19th century clouds looming over physics so by the metaphor clouds he was uh, referring to some unsolved problems in the clear sky of physics so his uh, metaphor his idea metaphorically he was meaning that uh, the sky of physics is uh, was very clear that means everything has been uh, discovered but there are some dark clouds one or two clouds um, passing um, on this clear sky so the what are these clouds uh, some unsolved problems in physics so he was uh, apparently expecting hoping that uh, these two cloud the clouds two or three clouds will be soon dispelled okay Th those problems will be soon um, solved okay so let us see what are these clouds meant by kelvin this cloud one referred by lord kelvin was black body radiation problem this uh, idea of black body was put forward by this person Kirchhoff in 1860. What is a black body? It's an ideal body that absorbs all the radiations incident on it without reflecting any energy and uh, it then emits radiations of all frequencies. Black body is an idealization of any condensed matter. Condensed matter means it can be solid, liquid or high density gas uh, at any temperature. So um, normally we know that when you when you uh, heat a solid, okay. Um, so when you heat it, basically you are providing, you are giving infrared heat radiations or infrared radiations to it. So some of the radiations will be absorbed, some of the radiations will be reflected. This is so in the case of uh, any condensed matter, any solid, liquid, or high density gas. Now. Um, uh, Kelvin, uh, sorry, Kirchhoff was just uh, idealizing this concept. He imagined, uh, proposed the idea of an ideal uh, uh, black body or an ideal body uh, which uh, absorbs all the radiations incident on it without any reflection. Okay, so this uh, we, we know in optical region, I mean visible region of electromagnetic spectrum, a body that absorbs all the radiations incident on it um, looks black. Okay, so in that sense, he proposed this word black body, which is a body that absorbs all the radiations incident on it. Not necessarily, uh, not only visible light, but any radiations. Okay, then it emits, its temperature will increase. At any temperature, it will emit radiations also. Okay, so this, uh, this is the idea of black body. Now, let us see what is the black body radiation problem. This is a black body radiation problem. Uh, Kirchhoff uh, postulated that the energy density, that means energy per unit volume of radiations emitted by a black body in thermal equilibrium is independent of the size, shape, volume and the material of the body. Okay, um, whatever be the size of the this black body or shape or volume or material of the body, energy density will always be uh, independent uh, it will be the same it is independent of these factors now then what 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 are the factors on which this energy density depends it's a universal function of the absolute temperature of the body capital t and the frequency nu of the emitted radiation okay why is it called a universal function because it is uh, the same for all black bodies okay of any material any size shape and volume so th there is a common behavior that is why a universal behavior that's why we call it a, a common function or a universal function which depends only on the absolute temperature of the black body and uh, the frequency of the emitted radiation so let us uh, convert this idea into mathematical symbols if we use u for capital u for energy density of black body uh, radiations then it depends on it's a function of frequency and absolute temperature okay uh, so kirchhoff postulated that uh, in his 1860 paper he postulated that such a universal function of energy density can exist such a function exists for black body 
Now the next question is what is the functional form of this energy density? Whether u is equal to nu plus t, nu into t, nu by t, okay, e raised to nu into t, log nu t, any possibilities are sin nu t or sin nu by t. So what is the functional form of this uh, energy density? This question was posed by Kirchhoff in 1860 and uh, this question is called black body radiation problem. Okay, what is the functional form of energy density of black body radiations? And uh, this was cloud one. Okay, this was an unsolved problem by the time Lord Kelvin was making his speech in, 18, in 1900. What happens to this cloud one eventually? This cloud one uh, evolves into a big problem or big uh, area in physics. Uh, Max Planck's attempt to solve this problem resulted in the idea of energy quantization in 1900. Soon after, in the same year, uh, Lord Kelvin made his speech. Uh, so Max Planck uh, tried to solve this black body radiation problem and in his solution he introduced the idea of energy quantization. This later developed into the theory of quantum mechanics in 1925-26. So we can say cloud one uh, gets bigger very big uh, into, into the branch of quantum mechanics. Okay, that, that was a tip of the iceberg, we can say. Okay, it was not a very small cloud. Hmm. So that is about the uh, first cloud of... Uh, it was in... Uh, let, let's look at the second cloud. Uh, this problem we can call the problem of ether. So what was this problem of ether? It was in 1864 that uh, James Clerk Maxwell proposed the existence of electromagnetic waves. Um, he showed that uh, a combination of electric fields and magnetic fields can pro propagate through space uh, as a wave and he uh, called it electromagnetic wave. In addition, he showed that uh, light is also, light was also an electromagnetic wave. He calculated the speed of electromagnetic waves and uh, found that it is very clear, very near to uh, 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second, which was very close to the, the, the value of um, um, uh, level speed of light measured at that time. So he concluded that light must be an electromagnetic wave and he also proposed that there can be other types of electromagnetic waves. That was in 1864. Then immediately a question was asked. Uh, by Ma Maxwell himself and by other physicists uh, that is what is the medium of propagation of electromagnetic waves all the waves uh, known to physicists uh, until, until that time were waves which are passing through some medium okay uh, waves on water surface sound waves waves on a string so what is the medium of propagation for electromagnetic waves and uh, they used the word ether to, to for such a medium Maxwell himself uh, believed that uh, such a medium is the uh, for the propagation of electromagnetic waves. Then immediately <coughs> uh, people were trying to, experimentalists were trying to detect this ether. Okay, so even 40 years after, uh, one of the one of the uh, most uh, famous um, experimental experiment to detect the ether was done by uh, Michelson himself, uh, the same Michelson that we, Albert Michelson, that we uh, met already. Uh, he, along with another physicist, uh, Morley, Michelson and Morley, this experiment uh, to detect the ether, uh, this was done in 1887, 1887 and uh, this was one of the major experiments uh, attempts to, de to detect the presence of ether and this was a failure. In the sense that the experiments could not detect the presence of ether. So again, uh, this was the second cloud uh, that Mac, uh, the Kelvin was referring, Lord Kelvin was referring to in his 1900 speech. So even at the time of the speech of Kelvin, the there was no successful um, experimental discovery of this ether. So the, the question of ether, question of the medium of electromagnetic waves was the second cloud referred by Kelvin. This cloud too also gets very big. Okay, Albert Einstein's attempt to solve this problem of um, um, ether. Okay, this resulted in the theory of special relativity in 1905. Um, 
actually albert einstein was not directly trying to uh, solve the problem of uh, the, the the medium of electromagnetic waves or ether but uh, he was trying to address some uh, discrepancies between uh, classical newtonian mechanics and uh, electromagnetic theory of maxwell newton's mechanics and maxwell's electromagnetic theory so when we, when he tried to solve these discrepancies eventually um, the question of uh, medium of electromagnetic waves was also addressed and uh, his attempt to solve the discrepancy between newton's mechanics and maxwell's electromagnetic theory developed into special relativity that was that was in 1905 five years after um, lord kelvin's speech this is einstein in 1905 he was uh, 26 years uh, age at that time he was a patent officer um, um, at uh, Swiss uh, office, Swiss, Swiss, Switzerland based patent office at that time, and uh, this is uh, his signature. You can see here, and here this on the electrodynamics of moving bodies is the title of one of his papers in 1905 that uh, discussed uh, this problem of uh, this this uh, that developed this issue of uh, special relativity. Okay. Okay, in his speech, Lord Kelvin was referring to only two clouds. Okay, uh, the black body radiation problem, cloud one, and uh, the issue of ether, cloud two. But we can slightly extend uh, his uh, metaphor of this unsolved problems in physics. We can call it call them as clouds, and we can look at a few more unsolved problems uh, around uh, 1900. Okay, at the time of uh, Kelvin's speech. Okay, so let us consider at least two more clouds. This was cloud 3, the photoelectric effect. This was discovered by Henrik Hertz in 1887. What is photoelectric effect? When light shines on a metal surface, uh, electrons are emitted from the surface. Okay, uh, here the, on the left hand side, you can see here, uh, this, uh, this is uh, some electromagnetic radiations. When it is incident on a metal surface, electrons are instantaneously emitted. That is called photoelectric effect. Now, many properties of this photoelectric effect, we will discuss them um, in detail in another class. Many properties of this phenomenon could not be explained by 19th century physics. So, this was clearly an unsolved problem, a cloud uh, in the sky of physics. Now, the cloud 3 also gets big. Again, it was Albert Einstein who attempted to solve this problem in the same year, 1905. And this resulted uh, in the discovery of energy quantum of radiation, which was later called photon. Okay, uh, you, this was Einstein's equation. Uh, if uh, you have an electromagnetic radiation of frequency nu, its energy is quantized with uh, one quantum of radiation equals, energy of one quantum of radiation equals h nu, where h is Planck's constant. Okay, this is the title of uh, Einstein's uh, paper in 1905, which uh, uh, solved the, uh, the problem of photoelectric effect by introducing the idea of photon. Uh, this Analander Physics is a German physics journal. You might have seen, noticed the same name in, 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 uh, black body in the slide on black body radiation problem. Right. Uh, so this is a major. This was the major physics journal at that time, German journal. Uh, Kirchhoff, in 40 years back, Kirchhoff um, proposed the idea of black body in the same journal, and uh, Einstein's paper, Max Planck's paper, came in the same journal in 1900. Einstein's papers in 1905 came in the same journal. So this is the uh, development of cloud three. And uh, one more point, in 1905, Einstein published five different papers and uh, each of them changed physics uh, dramatically, okay, very fundamentally and dramatically. Uh, Einstein's special theory of relativity was discussed in two papers and one paper discuss, uh, discussed this uh, photoelectric effect and uh, introduced the idea of photon. And uh, there was a, another paper that uh, explained uh, a Brownian motion and uh, that uh, gave significant contribution in the field of statistical physics. And the fourth paper, which was actually his PhD thesis, uh, this proved the existence of atom. Now, from a theoretical point of view, it uh, proved the existence of atom. 
So in this way, Einstein's five papers in 1905 uh, were major contributions in physics that changed physics very fundamentally. So that is the idea of cloud 3. Cloud 4 is uh, the problem of line spectrum of elements. What is this problem? Uh, first, let us look at uh, two persons who worked on this problem during the period 1850 uh, to 1859. Uh, Gustav uh, Kirchhoff and uh, Robert Bunsen. Okay? Uh, Kirchhoff, we have already met uh, the same person who proposed the idea of black body. He is standing on the left side and this is the senior person, Bunsen. Uh, Bunsen, uh, we, we, the, the Bunsen burner in chemistry lab is named after Bunsen. So these duo, these two persons collaborated in, uh, during 1850 to 1859 and uh, made fundamental contributions in spectroscopy. Um, so one of their discoveries uh, was that the spectrum uh, it was already known that uh, <clears throat> during that uh, even before that uh, it was known that um, when we take uh, um, elements in the form of low density gas for example you take a sodium okay and then uh, make it into vapor phase and uh, take it in a vessel in low density okay the sodium vapor lamp um, that we see uh, on sea street lamps sodium vapor lamp in our labs okay uh, these are all low density vapors hmm? similarly we can have mercury vapor gas in a, in a, in a glass container that is uh, mercury uh, vapor a mercury um, uh, mercury vapor lamp okay in that we have mercury vapor in low density so in this way when we take uh, an element in in a pure element in low density vapor form and uh, produce its spectrum there are different ways for that uh, to produce spectrum. In the time of uh, Kirchhoff and Bunsen, they were using arc lamps. Nowadays, what we do is we pass an electric discharge through this uh, low density gas. Okay, then uh, if you pass an electric discharge, uh, either an arc lamp, you heat the vapor using an arc lamp, or you pass electric uh, discharge through this low density gas, then um, it emits a light. Okay, when this light is passed through some uh, prism, or, or, or grating, okay, optical grating, then this light will be dispersed into different spectral lines, uh, like that we observe here. Okay, so here we can observe a mercury vapor spectrum, here we can observe um, sodium vapor spectrum, okay, so this is mercury spectrum, this is sodium spectrum. Now, in particular, why I am talking about mercury spectrum and sodium spectrum is these two uh, spectra you will observe in, in a BSc physics lab. Hmm? you have to do experiments using both mercury vapor spectrum and sodium vapor spectrum. So these are the typical spectrum that we will see in our spectrometer experiments in BSc practicals. Um, so these are line spectrum in the sense that what we see here is on a dark background bright lines we can observe. So you have bright lines on specific wavelengths. You have a violet line, okay, um, then a blue uh, line a blue green line etc you at a specific specific wavelengths hmm? here also it is like that so this is a line this is called a line spectrum this is actually called an emission line spectrum on a, a dark background you have bright lines so one of their discoveries uh, discoveries of this uh, Kirchhoff and Bunsen was that uh, the line spectrum of elements is characteristic property of that element if you take the line spectrum of an element, it's a characteristic property of that element. Uh, that means uh, it is unique for that element. If you take mercury vapor spectrum, it's a line spectrum. It's, if you take sodium vapor spectrum, it is another line spectrum. But when you compare the two, they are different. The positions of the spectral lines, the wavelength positions means the wavelengths. The wavelengths of these spectral lines are in mercury vapor spectrum are different from wavelengths in the sodium vapor spectrum. Okay, the, the signature of sodium vapor spectrum is uh, two yellow double lines. I mean, two, two uh, yellow lines or double lines which are closely spaced. So this is uh, this uh, unique combination of lines at uh, specific wavelengths is, uh, is unique for um, sodium vapor, I mean, mercury vapor, right? So in, in the bottom uh, region, we can see uh, the, the, this one is a uh, uh, hydrogen spectrum. 
okay uh, the emission spectrum of hydrogen so the their first discovery was that uh, the line spectrum of each element is uh, unique second discovery they made was that uh, if you take uh, for example in, in hydrogen spectrum what you observe here is uh, emission spectrum of hydrogen that means on a dark background you have bright lines these lines are named like this uh, this red line it was called h alpha line the blue line is called h beta line then um, this is a blue green line then a blue line is called h gamma uh, a violet line is called h delta like that mm. uh, okay so it is like that um, so this was um, uh, hydrogen uh, emission spectrum of hydrogen this uh, here the first person who measured this uh, first emission line that is h alpha line was angstrom in 1853 we use the word his name angstrom to for a for a unit in of length 10 raised to minus 10 meter okay then another person who further measured have more lines in hydrogen spectrum was huggins in 1881 then uh, okay so when we consider this, this one this is you have on a bright background you have got dark lines this is called an absorption spectrum of hydrogen okay um, so an absorption spectrum is typically produced like this um, you take a hydrogen vapor in a container in a glass container uh, at low temperature okay uh, then um, a continuous uh, radiation radiation of all wavelengths are passed through this cold vapor then what happens is um, some of the characteristic wavelengths are absorbed by hydrogen atoms and uh, um, when we observe the the light emerging out of the emerging on the other side of this glass vessel uh, this light will look like this on a bright background because we are passing all the um, all the radiations of all frequencies uh, through the vessel so we have a bright background but some of the wavelengths will be absorbed by the hydrogen okay so um, you, you get dark lines the whatever be the wavelengths absorbed by the hydrogen those wavelengths will be absent in the emergent radiation so on a bright background you have dark lines so this is called an, an absorption line spectrum you can see that if you look at the position of h alpha line on the emission spectrum of hydrogen and absorption spectrum of hydrogen the position is exactly the same at the at the location of the red line okay uh, similarly h beta line will be exactly the same each line in the emission spectrum will exactly correspond to the i mean matches with the corresponding line in the uh, absorption spectrum exactly matching means their wavelengths will be the same so this was the second major discovery by Kirchhoff and Bunsen. Uh, the, the spectral lines in the emission spectrum and absorption spectrum uh, of, uh, of the same element ha have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay. So these are two major properties of line spectrum of elements. One is that they are uh, line spectrum of each element is unique to that element. Second is that uh, wavelengths of spectral lines in the emission spectrum and absorption spectrum of the same element have the same value okay now what is the problem here is uh, even though these were experimentally discovered uh, in the 19th century right from uh, the beginning of the 19th century uh, spectral lines were not right from the beginning of the 19th century uh, but uh, what is the reason for this type of uh, peculiar properties that was not known that was not clear there was no explanation for that that is uh, why is it that uh, uh, we can ask three questions one why is it that uh, the spectrum of elements are line spectrum why do we get specific lines at specific wavelengths why it is not continuous so why we have line spectrum secondly why is it that the line spectrum of each element is unique now thirdly why is it that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the observed spectral lines in the emission spectrum and the absorption spectrum of the same element? Why? These were some unsolved problems in physics and we can call it cloud four. It was Niels Bohr who solved this uh, cloud four, the question of uh, line spectrum of elements. Um, 
Niels Bohr's attempt to solve this problem resulted in the Bohr atom model of hydrogen in 1913. Okay, so cloud four also gets very big. It led to the uh, the Bohr model of hydrogen atom, and uh, this Bohr model showed that atomic energy levels are quantized. This is a typical what you see on the right side is a is a typical diagram um, uh, using different Bohr orbits. And uh, these are the different electronic transitions producing different spectral lines in hydrogen, Lyman series, Balmer series, etc. Okay. Uh, this, the, the, the hydrogen spectral series that we uh, we have seen in the slide before, it, it is called it is in the visible region and it is called the Balmer series. Okay. We will uh, consider these uh, details in detail uh, when we discuss atomic structure. Okay, so the point is that uh, this fourth un, uh, unsolved problem, this fourth cloud, was also led to some fundamental development in physics, which is Bohr atom model, uh, which in turn showed that uh, atomic spectra, atomic energy levels were quantized. They are quantized. These are the creators of quantum mechanics um, in, go, in the in the period called golden twenties. The, the details of quantum theory, even though quantum mechanics, uh, we can say, began with uh, Max Planck's explanation of black body radiation problem in 1900, uh, and later uh, by Einstein's explanation of photoelectric effect in 1905, and also by Bohr's atom model, Bohr atom model in 1913, uh, many uh, modern development of quantum mechanics or the new quantum theory. Uh, that was developed starting with the uh, de Broglie hypothesis uh, in 1924. Okay, so from 1924 up to 1930s, um, uh, the, the basics were developed uh, by 1927 and in 1930s some new uh, extra details were added. So the, the this is called this period uh, from 1924 to 1930 that was called golden 20. So the major contributors of quantum mechanics during this period and during the 1930s some of them were de Broglie, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Dirac, Max Born, Pauli, Fermi, Feynman and there were others also. Okay, So the, their presence here, um, why I uh, showed them here is to, to, to clearly underline that uh, the physics has clearly changed um, in this period. Okay, uh, there is a huge change from 19th century physics to the modern physics and uh, quantum mechanics is a major aspect of modern physics and uh, these were the major players, some of the major players in quantum mechanics. Okay. So the series of experimental discoveries starting from 1895, we have seen some of them. And also the theoretical attempts to solve the unsolved problems in 19th century physics. We have considered four such unsolved problems. Now these two aspects together, these two developments together, some, on, on, on one side we have a series of experimental discoveries uh, which could not be explained by 19th century physics. On the other side we have new theoretical uh, attempts. Uh, to solve some of these experiments, some of the unsolved problems in 19th century physics. And uh, these two developments together constituted what we now call modern physics. So this was a new physics. And the, look at the irony, uh, in, in 1894 and 1900 we have seen two major physicists um, echoing the, the, the feelings of maybe other physicists that, uh, physicists that um, there was nothing new to be discovered in physics. Okay, whatever, what, what remains to be done is more and more accurate measurements. But uh, here we see that very soon after um, they, they made their, their statements, uh, physics was actually changing. Okay, even while, even by the time they were making these statements, physics was changing and a new physics was developed. The three uh, major components of modern physics are quantum mechanics, special relativity and general relativity. Now uh, in this course uh, we will be concentrating on quantum mechanics. Um, 
special relativity you have studied already in mechanics course and uh, general relativity is not usually part of bsc physics program but uh, in msc physics program part of your msc physics program uh, in some universities you will encounter uh, the a course on general relativity so um, when we look at uh, the, these developments um, quantum mechanics was um, developed by a group of uh, um, scientists uh, in various uh, time starting from max planck's explanation to black body radiation problem in 1900 up to uh, 1920s we have seen some of the figures um, scientists who contributed in 1920s now special relativity and general relativity were uh, works of almost a single person albert einstein Uh, special relativity he developed in 1905 and general relativity some 10 years later in 1916 uh, so we will look at quantum mechanics in this pro in, in this particular course now this diagram will give you an idea of uh, how much uh, this new physics has uh, developed in comparison with the old physics by old physics i am saying Uh, the physics up to 19th century up to the end of 19th century okay um, this physics 19th century physics uh, we call now we use the term classical physics for that uh, the major components of 19th century physics were newton's mechanics newtonian mechanics then electrodynamics okay and uh, thirdly thermodynamics so these three were the major components of 19th century physics and uh, we have seen that uh, starting from 1895 onwards new experimental discoveries were made and uh, even before that there were some experimental discoveries which were unsolved uh, problems uh, black body radiation problem photoelectric effect uh, these were discovered even before 1895 right and uh, then this uh, problem of uh, spectral lines that was known right from the, the beginning of 1800 1815 onwards then um yeah then this question of ether uh, starting from 1864 onwards the question of ether was there so these were some unsolved problems in 19th century physics and the attempts to uh, solve this problem and attempts to address the new experimental discoveries led to um, modern physics and uh, now we can see this diagram here on the x axis uh, on the, on the x axis size logarithm of size is plotted logarithm of size of a system we have we are taking logarithmic uh, scale because we have to consider very large from very small to very large sizes so logarithmic scale is more suitable on the y axis we plot speeds of particles from 0 to maximum speed of light in vacuum that is the maximum speed attainable for a material particle according to special relativity so um when the this 19 look at the 19th century physics 19th century physics explains uh phenomena only in the scale of uh, medium size right and medium speed okay some uh, some intermediate size uh, of the order uh, of um, from a few centimeters to a few meters we can say okay an intermediate uh, size size of our uh, dimension and intermediate speed uh, compare speed very small compared to speed of light in vacuum so at low speeds and intermediate size we have um, the phenomenon can be phenomena can be explained uh, by 19th century physics classical physics but if you go in let us look at the size scale if you go to very small sizes okay uh, microscopic bodies uh, microscopic size um, nano size that means atomic level systems subatomic level systems nuclear systems then uh, classical physics no longer is applicable you have to use quantum physics so quantum this is the realm of quantum physics and in the very low dimensions okay molecular level atomic level and subatomic level um, nuclear level we we need quantum mechanics when you go to very large size of the order of um, light years okay very large sizes of the order of the distance between uh, planets stars galaxies etc then 
um, in very large uh, realm, uh, what is we have to apply is general relativity. Okay, in, in this large region. There are also classical physics as we know. Newtonian physics is not applicable um, where we need general relativity. General relativity was actually, it is actually the, the generalization or an a generalization of Newton's gravitational law. Okay, so uh, it's a new gravitational law. So general relativity is required in this uh, large scale uh, in order to explain large size, large scale phenomena. Hmm? When you go to speed, uh, at the low speed phenomenon we can uh, and the medium size phenomenon we can explain by classical physics. But when you go to very high speeds, closer to the speed of light in vacuum, we need special relativity. Okay, so if it is a small size, uh, uh, small system and high speed system, we need both quantum mechanics and special relativity. Okay, relativistic quantum mechanics, okay, quantum field theory, etc. And if it is a high uh, scale system, high dimensional system, higher dimensional system, I mean, long, uh, large dimension system, and uh, high speeds are there, like the movement of galaxies, okay, then you need special relativity as well as general relativity. Okay. So this is the situation in physics now. And we can see that uh, the clouds that uh, the, this 19th century clouds that uh, Kelvin was metaphorically referring to, these clouds have grown into the new sky. They occupy the majority uh, of physics now. 19th century physics has become a very, a very small portion and a small approximation of uh, um, this large uh, sky okay so this is uh, the the story of modern physics this is the plan of the course uh, for quantum mechanics um, we have um, five units particle properties of waves atomic structure wave properties of particles wave mechanics hydrogen atom uh, in uh, the syllabus in our university, in University of Calicut, after particle properties of waves, we have wave properties of particles and then atomic structure. It follows uh, this textbook, Concepts of Modern Physics by Arthur Baser. Okay, the syllabus is uh, in the follow follows uh, the order in which the these uh, text gives the different topics. But uh, I will teach uh, first particle properties of waves, then atomic structure, and then wave properties of particles. That is historically more accurate, uh, and that is more convenient for discussing the ideas. Okay, then we will go to wave mechanics and hydrogen atom. I will be using three references. One is the book of study, Concepts of Modern Physics by Arthur Baser. Uh, sixth edition is better. Then I will use Modern Physics by Kenneth Crane. The latest edition is... Uh, edition 3 edition 4 is also available i will be using edition 3 and one more reference will be modern physics by three authors raymond survey clement moses and kurt moyer edition 3 so these three books will be our references so this is the entire plan of the course i will briefly uh, look at uh, each uh, um, unit uh, first unit is particle properties of waves where the major topics are black body radiation problem, then photoelectric effect, Compton scattering, pair production, photons and gravity. Okay, we will discuss each of them in detail. The second unit is atomic structure. We will discuss Bohr atom model of hydrogen atom, then the effect of nuclear motion uh, on different equations of Bohr atom model and an experimental proof of Bohr atom model, Frank Hertz experiment. Third unit, wave properties of particles. We will discuss de Broglie waves, the idea of de Broglie wave, then electron diffraction experiment, electron microscope is an application of that, uh, probability interpretation of uh, wave function, wave packet and the idea of group velocity, uncertainty relationship between position and momentum, uncertainty relationship between energy and time, and some of the consequences and applications of uncertainty uh, relationships. In wave mechanics, we will look at uh, time dependent Schrodinger equation, time independent Schrodinger equation, admissibility conditions on wave function, then operators, what is meant by operators, eigenvalues of operators and expectation values of operators. 
okay we will also study some applications of uh, schrodinger equation uh, in particular we will discuss applications of in one dimensional systems four applications we will study in detail particle in an infinite potential well particle in a finite potential well potential barrier uh, which is also called tunnel effect and linear harmonic oscillator okay so this is the content of the fourth unit wave mechanics the last two unit is hydrogen atom here we study uh, separation of variables in schrodinger equation and uh, we rewrite schrodinger equation of hydrogen atom in three as three ordinary this is a partial differential equation um, and this we will write rewrite as three ordinary differential equation one r equation equation in radial variable and uh, principal quantum number comes from this equation and second is theta equation uh, equation in polar angle theta and orbital quantum number small l comes from this equation and the third is uh, phi equation phi is the azimuthal angle okay and uh, magnetic orbital quantum number uh, ml m suffix l comes from this equation okay then uh, electron probability density uh, radiative transitions and selection rules seaman effect we will discuss in detail we will also look at stern gerlach experiment and the idea of electron spin and exclusion principle so these are the content of uh, the fifth unit hydrogen atom so that is the end of our discussion on the introduction of this course evolution of modern physics in the next class we will start with the first unit particle properties of waves and the first topic will be black body radiation problem what we see on the figure is uh, typical black body radiation spectrum so we will look at this spectrum its properties etc uh, in the next class that's all thank you